Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to address you today. Let me first of all thank the World Academy of Arts and Science and personally Mr. Gary Jacobs and Annette Kininger Basili for organizing such a timely and comprehensive conference geared towards developing strategies for transformative global leadership. We are currently facing trying times. However, your participation in this virtual conference is a proof that despite the COVID-19 pandemic and the urgency to address its effects, we are not losing sight of other equally pressing global challenges, such as climate change, peace and security, and sustainable development. The World Academy of Arts and Science has made its mandate to find new perspectives and innovative approaches for global challenges. In doing so, it brings together a diverse spectrum of actors from international organizations, governments, civil society, academia, private sector, and media. The event we start today is part of a broader project on global leadership in the 21st century a joint initiative by the World of Academy of Arts and Science and the United Nations Office in Geneva. A lot of preparatory work has already been done to feed into this event. Your papers, video contributions, panel discussions, and sessions over the next five days will be a highly relevant and necessary input for the Conference on Global Leadership to be held in October this year. Based on multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral approach, we aim to identify strategies and principles for a new dynamic and transformative leadership to successfully accelerate progress on pressing global challenges, including the implementation of the strategic development goals. With the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, global leaders have been put under enormous stress of leadership, prioritization, and decision-making, both nationally and internationally. In this context, many lessons can be drawn on what effective leadership truly means. This is why I am even more convinced that the event and the broader project which started before we were hit by the pandemic, will bring great added value in proposing a type of leadership that is needed now more than ever. The solutions to the challenges we face today will not be found overnight. Finding the answers to complex cross-border problems can only be the result of a longer-term consultative and, most importantly, multilateral processes. Without a truly united international community and strong multilateral actions based on solidarity and inclusivity, we will never succeed in fighting the pandemic and effectively address its long-term impact, nor stay on track in, to overcome global challenges and achieve sustainable development goals. Today's event, will provide an important impetus in this regard. I look forward to your innovative ideas and contribution on how global leadership could become more dynamic, effective, and transformative, and how international cooperation could be further strengthened. I wish you all fruitful discussions and hope to see you next October. Thank you. Thank you to Madam Balabaya, the Director General of the UN in Geneva, to Tedros Ghebreyesus, the Director General of WHO, to President Bayara Kifriberger from Latvia, President Emil Constantinescu from Romania, and Federico Mayor, former Director General of the United Nations. UNESCO in Paris. Deeply grateful to the United Nations in Geneva for partnering with us and hosting this conference. To the Director General and the wonderful team 
headed by her cabinet, David Chikvaitse, and all those in the UN who have collaborated with us and made this event possible, and all our other partner organizations around the world who are contributing to the 35 sessions with more than 200 speakers who will be participating. It's exactly seven years ago last week that the United Nations in Geneva invited the World Academy to collaborate on a conference on the need for a new paradigm in human development. We had more than 200 diplomats in the Palais de Nation examining the challenges facing the world in the 21st century and the need for substantial changes in the way we're approaching them. The need for leadership in policy and in strategy in institutions, in thought, in values, in thinking that is necessary. And the Academy in collaboration with many partner organizations have been working the last seven years on trying to evaluate and identify what changes are really needed to make a breakthrough in progress. 2020, the 60th anniversary of the World Academy founded in 1960, just in the middle of the Cold War when it was still heating up by very eminent intellectuals. The 75th anniversary of the United Nations. 2020 represents another crisis point in modern history, which probably few of us anticipated just a few years ago. The pandemic is only the latest, most dramatic, most intensely felt of these events. The economic recession, which is just amidst us and is growing in proportions, the retreat from democracy, renewed arms race, talk of nuclear weapons, the polarization of society, and of course, the climate challenge, which grows day by day. All of these were problems that we thought would be overcome at the end of the Cold War. We never imagined that they would be resurging and growing in intensity and magnitude at, in, and surfacing in new ways. And we also faced new ones which we didn't anticipate at the end of the Cold War at all. And yet at the very time when we're faced with these intense challenges, we face a global leadership vacuum, a loss of trust in our institutions, not only at the global level, but at the national level as well. And yet there's a certain irony here because this is a time when, a time greater than any in history, when humanity has the capacity to address its problems successfully. We have the capacity to meet the needs of every human being on earth. What we seem to lack is the capacity to mobilize these resources effectively, to, to mobilize the political will to address these challenges straight on. We suffer from a sense of helplessness to overcome the powers of entrenched forces, vested interests, inertia, and ignorance at the very time when we need to act and we do have the capacity to act. And yet the pandemic shows us that just in a few short months, when humanity does feel mobilized, does feel the urgency, does feel the need for action, that we have the capacity for concerted action at unprecedented speed and magnitude, and even for global cooperation at that level. Our challenge today is how do we convert these unprecedented challenges into unprecedented opportunities. And a critical link for that is leadership. The SDGs provide to us for the first time in humanity, a set of inspiring goals, common goals negotiated by 193 countries that humanity has agreed we must achieve. It is a form of leadership in direction. We need also the leadership of outstanding individuals of all ages from the 15 year olds uh, up to show us the way. But we know we need much more than that. We need leadership in ideas, leadership in values, leadership in organization, leadership in strategy, leadership in policy, leadership in business, 
leadership in the, the civil society, leadership in education and, uh, and research in other areas as well. Today we know pretty well what our problems are. We don't need decades of analysis to tell us what they are. And ironically, we know pretty well what the, the solutions for many, if not all of these problems. Our challenge is to tr transform the long, slow process of social evolution into a rapid process of conscious social transformation. The idea of so social transformation is not just a utopian idea. We have lived through and seen dramatic transformations in our lifetime, things that we never believed would be possible just a few years, sometimes a few days before they uh, took place. The abolition of colonial empires after World War II, which was not predicted at the time the UN was founded, the end of the Cold War and the democratization of Eastern Europe, the unification of Europe, the birth of the internet, these are monumental achievements which were not anticipated just a few years earlier. What we're looking for out of this conference is not just talking about the problems or even talking about the grand solutions, but how do we move forward? What are the catalytic strategies that we can use to break the inertia and the resistance, ideas that can lead to action and promote human security for all humanity? This conference is not the end of a project. It's, we're in the middle, and it's not intended to give us all the answers. We look at it as a process of collaborative discovery and preparation for the main conference at UNOG in October, October 27th and 28th. I thank you on behalf of the Academy for your participation and look forward to collaborating with you during these five days and in the months beyond in which we'll be uh, working on this project together. Thank you. And now I have the privilege to introduce the Director General of WHO, who is faced with monumental responsibilities today un in an un unenvious position uh, when the whole world is, is looking to WHO for answers. Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. Please, sir. Ms. Tatiana Valovaya, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. Thank you to the United Nations Office in Geneva and the World Academy of Art and Science for coordinating this virtual conference on global leadership in the 21st century. COVID-19 is the defining health crisis of our time. The pandemic has appended lives and livelihoods. It has exploited gaps in health systems and magnified inequalities. It has highlighted our strengths and our vulnerabilities. Nations have come together as never before and geopolitical divisions have been exposed. We have seen what's possible with cooperation, and what we risk without it. The greatest threat we face now is not the virus itself. It is the absence of global solidarity and global leadership. We cannot defeat this pandemic with a divided world. More than ever, the pandemic has illustrated the critical importance of national unity and global solidarity. And more than ever, the pandemic has illustrated the need for transformative leadership. As I have said many times, health is a political choice. COVID-19 has robbed us of so much, but it has also given us something, an opportunity to forge a common future. Even as we work to end the pandemic, WHO remains committed to working with all countries to redouble our efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals for a healthier, safer, fairer world. I thank you. Spasiva, Tatiana. Thank you.
Director General Gabriezis. I now have the pleasure to introduce the former president of Latvia, Beara Vaiki Friedberger, served as the president from 1999 to 2007. She's the co-chair of the Nizami Ganjavi International Center in Baku and a fellow of the World Academy. Madam President, please. Uh, distinguished dignitaries, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear virtual participants uh, in this conference. All of us together, we are travelers on this spaceship Earth, and all of us gathered here today on the uh, waves of the ether, we are thinking of a better world and of leadership that could lead us there. We have the United Nations, in it. it's now celebrating its 75th year. We have countless experts, great minds. We have the Sustainable Development Goals, which have been arrived at with a great deal of effort and uh, deep thought uh, about this content and the goodwill of millions of people across the world who would like to participate. Yet we know very well that, yes, we find ourselves sometimes helpless uh, and our goodwill uh, is not enough to change the world. Well, I would say that the march forward of civilizations and of societies has always been step by step. Dr. Jacobs has just suggested that that's too slow, uh, that we should sort of uh, increase our pace and march rather more str strongly. Uh, the danger for us is, as the uh, Canadian writer um, pointed out in, uh, in an amusing uh, image, if you want to uh, quick action, you want great investment uh, in doing something. He had this phrase about a hero. He ran out of the house and jumped on his horse and rode off in all directions. Uh, the organizations that are participating in our meeting here today, we are all riding in our own direction and yet at the same time we are guided by an ultimate goal which is the betterment of society and the betterment of humanity. What is holding back uh, this process we know very well uh, it is the entrenched self-interest of those who have power, either of position or of money or uh, of whatever kind. And it is also the inertia of the majority of our populations who are so engrossed in surviving, who are so engrossed in their day-to-day -day affairs that they are indifferent to what is happening beyond their own borders, beyond their own threshold of their own house. It is the task of those who have ideas to make sure that those who are indifferent, those who are not acti actively participating in changing the situation in the world, that they should not sink into despair and depression because they feel powerless, they feel left behind. We should mobilize as many of our general population as we can to have a sense of empowerment, to have a sense of entitlement, to have a sense of belonging to a whole of which they are a part and which gives them the inherent right that they do not have to earn or they don't have to buy as human beings to be respected and to be allowed the same opportunities as anybody else. That message has been, of course, with us for a couple of millennia. It is being repeated and is being repeated by the organizations here represented and others beyond them. But ladies and gentlemen, we have to each, each of us in our own personal lives, in the contacts that we have, continue to embody that conviction that every human being is of equal worth as any other 
and that the organizations of which we are part or which we are, have the honor of leading, that these organizations spread the message of hope, of empowerment, and of uh, human destiny, something that we have all of us in common, that we all have a right to participate in a future that belongs to everybody, the young and the old and the in-between, the rich and the poor and the in-between, the powerful and the powerless, and all of us together. Let's hope that we will accelerate the pace of us marching toward these goals. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And we look forward to hearing you, hearing further from you in the next session as well. Thank you so much for coming. I now have the privilege of introducing President Emil Constantinescu, President of Romania from 1996 to 2000. He's also a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Academy and the President of a Center of Excellence of the World Academy, recently started in Bucharest, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Levant Culture and Civilization. President Constantinescu. Uh, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to meet you all today, uh, albeit uh, virtually. What our conference uh, uh, has set out to discover is whether 21st century leadership can uh, deliver sustainable development uh, based on peace and social uh, solidarity. If uh, we look at history, we would do well to remember the two British Prime Ministers, Benjamin Disraeli, in 1878, and Neville Chamberlain in 1939, returned from Berlin, each claiming to have secured peace in our time. A reality soon contradicted both, when multiplying colonial clashes and regional struggles culminated in two old wars that saw the loss of tens of millions of lives. Uh, we live through decades of Cold War, which were followed by 30 years of hot global peace, based by civil strife, hybrid wars, and the globalization of terrorism. But there is scant remaining hope that either the current political leadership, primarily invested in power games, or the current financial leadership, primarily interested in maximizing profit, can adequately tackle the challenges of globalization. I have uh, tentatively sought an answer to the question whether war is an inherent outcome of human nature in the work of two German laureates of Nobel Prize for Literature, Thomas Mann in 1929 and Hermann Hesse in 1946. In the, in the Magic Mountain, the protagonist from the solace of the Swiss sanatorium believed that death was something that uh, happened to others up until he reached the front lines of war, causing Thomas Mann to wonder whether this festival of death would one day give rise to love. In 1943, during the Second World War, Hermann Hesse proposed in the glass bead game a model of a society predicated upon culture instead of violence and praise the benefits of cultural dialogue. We might rightly ask ourselves, given the spectacular development of intercultural dialogue occurring over the past decades, why is mankind currently facing so much paralyzing adversity and has to take spiraling violence? The culture of peace is much more than anti-cultural dialogue and cannot be disenfranchised from a new culture of democracy and a new culture of market economy. It's a generous and exciting proposition of a truly shared society, a challenge, a hope, or a dream. During the panel of the Global Baku Forum, my good friend Federico Mayor ask me about my vision of a society of shared values. My reply was that it was 
somewhat akin to an orchestra in which various different instruments simultaneously sounding various different chords can yet achieve overarching harmony. When the European Union chose a Beethoven Ninth Symphony uh, fourth movement as their anthem, that might have had in mind the title Ode to Joy. Yet, I believe the symbol here is more profound. As in the fourth movement, when the orchestra is joined by chorus and solo performance for the grand finale, governments, social growth, and individual personalities can work in harmony, preserving their identity. In the end, it is up to all of us and each of us individually to take part in the core for peace and sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, President Konstantinescu. Now, I'd like to introduce Federico Mayor, the Director General of the United Nations from 1987 to 2000, 1999 longest serving director general, I believe. He's also the chairman of the Foundation for the Culture of Peace based in Madrid, a long time fellow of the World Academy and member of our board of advisors, Professor Mayor. Thank you very much. Only with what I heard now, until now, I think that is a fantastic opening session because I have been very inspired by all what you have said. I know very well Gary Jacobs from many years. I have been very impressed with uh, uh, Madame Vaira Wickenfreiber's intervention. And I also would like now to, to once more to tell my friend, uh, the former president of Romania, that also he has been very inspiring. And uh, to all of you, I must be uh, today uh, uh, with this uh, situation of pandemics that uh, we must realize that uh, will be more frequent in the future because of the uh, traffic of humans around the world. But uh, I would very much like to tell you that to talk about the world leadership is finally to talk about the only solution that today can change the present trends. Because uh, I remember that uh, when I was Director General of UNESCO from the year uh, 1988, I already was talking about the culture of peace because, and I went to the heart of Africa, to Yamashukro, and uh, we said the solution is to change the culture. We have a culture of war, always, always under the power, absolute power of males. The male power has been from the origin of times. And they have followed a sinister a proverb that says, si vis pacem para velum. If you wish peace, prepare war. And we have been preparing war during all the history. And uh, in 1910, there was already a president of the United States that said, no, 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 no. After the First World War, he said, no, we cannot go like this. And he created in Geneva one uh, Society of Nations or League of Nations. And he said, from now on, we must give not only to the reason of the force, but to the force of the reason. And we must go through diplomats and we must go through the multilateral system. And uh, you know what happened? That once more, the Republican Party of the United States of North America disagreed with his president, Woodrow Wilson. And, and, and this should be now underscored. 
for the first time already, the United States proposed a system, a democratic president, that immediately the Republican Party put aside. And as you know, it is an incoherence, terrible incoherence, that the League of Nations, created by the President of the United States, had never a United States as member of the League of Nations. Well, then, uh, after many years, you know what happened. There was a terrible Second World War that I might remember now that we talk about the victims of the COVID that only, only in the Russian part of this, um, in the Soviet part of this uh, conflict, there were more than 25 million victims, million. The war, the war, the today's war in Syria, etc. These are the, re the reason, reason that we must take now into account. Well, uh, there was another president, Republican, not democratic, yes, as Obama was, that uh, created, after the Second World War, created a fantastic multilateral system. There was the United Nations. And the United Nations had the problems, as you know, of the uh, uh, Cold War during many years. But there were people. Some person was called uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and another that was called um, uh, Nelson Mandela, that at the end of the 80s changed the things. And we said, now, now is the moment for multilateralism. Now is the moment to, to, to find a solution. But regretfully, uh, there was a president of the United States that was Republican called Reagan, and uh, one uh, prime minister of United Kingdom called Thatcher, that they decided that the uh, reins of the of the public power at the worldwide level should be in six only, and they created the G6, and we started with this plutocratic solution of six countries. That in fact is one country, United States, but six countries having the power of the world, absolute power of the world and they created the neoliberal system. And now we must be very clear. Now what we need is to change the present trends of the neoliberal system, but a new leadership in the world. And this new leadership uh, should be the culture of peace and nonviolence, should be with the peoples. The United Nations Charter starts with one very simple word that says, we the people. At this moment was premature because uh, the 90% of the people in the world were uh, being born, living and dying in 40 kilometers square, and there was not possibility for them to have the power in their hands. But now, from some years ago, and we must uh, say that in some extent was because of the digital uh, technology, now we know what happens. Now we have voice. For the first time in history, the peoples can express themselves. But most of this, most even more important, is that for the first time in history as well, the women, the women are already in, in the power. And this is extremely relevant. I can tell you, with all my experience as Director General of UNESCO, that this is the solution. Because now for the first time, we can say that all the people, not one people that is always was male. Now we can say that all human beings are equal in dignity. And now we can have the voice of the women, we can have the voice of the young people, we can have the voice of all the people because all of them are able to invent the future. And to invent the future today is to have a recreation of the multilateral system. This is the solution. The United Nations now must be reinforced and we must abandon the G6, the G7, the G8, the G20, that is in fact the G1, and we must create a new leadership in all, in all the people, with all the people, with the peoples, with the range of the future. Thank you, Professor Mayor.
and thank you to all of the speakers in this opening plenary session at which have set forth some very challenging and issues for us to address in this conference. And it's certainly true, as President Vicky Freeberger said, to rush off in different directions is not leadership. To rush off in different directions is chaos and conflict. And we've seen what that can do. And we've seen it increasing over the last few years in the splintering of the consensus that was there at the end of the Cold War about what a common direction would be. And that's one of the principal goals of leadership is to create a clear direction and a consensus on that direction. And we've seen, as Professor Mayor said, that leadership by one nation, no matter how powerful, no matter how wealthy, thinking purely of its own requirements or from its own position is absolutely inadequate for the world today when we are more globalized and interconnected than ever before. The leadership we need is not for a nation that's going to save us from ourselves. The leadership is of humanity. And that's the word that we've heard over and over by the, the speakers this morning, multilateralism. Not a retreat from multilateralism, which is what it's been looking like for the last two decades, but a reaffirmation or reconceptualization of a multilateralism that really works for everybody and not just for the powerful or the wealthy. And that happens to be the, the topic of the next session, this very important topic for the, next, for the first open plenary discussion session of the conference. And before turning it over uh, to Donato Kinniger Sigli, the Vice President of the World Academy and the moderator for this session, I would just like to say that we're fortunate to have a number of very, very talented visionary women participating in this conference. And I reinforce the comment that Professor Mayor made, we have to all do this together. It's not for a few countries, it's not for a few organizations, it's for everybody. And I hope this conference will be a, a representation of that fact. We need all the voices and we need all the talent and ideas that we can have. So I thank you, the speakers in this opening session, and now turn it over to you, Donato, and let's begin the real conversation.
Thank 